I'm very honored to introduce this first panel of today's uh, forum. And the theme is new geopolitical configurations in the MEM region. Our panelists will discuss some recent developments in the area, uh, some very current, present issues, uh, or also like the Abraham Accords, or new directions of the Biden administration, for instance. The main speech will be delivered to us by distinguished Royal Highness Prince Turki El Faisal. He's the chairman of the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies in Saudi Arabia, Riyadh. So, ahla wa sahla, very happy to have him connected today via Skype. The second panelist is uh, Professor Gilles Kepel, professor of l'Università della Svizzera Italiana and PSL Paris Sciences et Lettres École Normale Supérieure à Paris. Very warm welcome here in Lugano. The chairman of the panel uh, will be, or is, uh, Matteo Legrenzi. Uh, he's a professor of international relations at the Ca Foscari University of uh, Venice. And I'm very pleased to have the two young change makers on stage as well. Uh, we have Reem from Abu Dhabi and Ala from Libya. So, ahla wa sahla, Kolum, very happy to listen to this first panel. Please. Thank you, Professor Boaz Erez, uh, President of the University of Lugano, and Professor Gilles Kepel, Chairperson of Cher Moyen Orient Mediterranean, for inviting me to speak to you today. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been witnessing during the last few weeks an unfolding drama in Afghanistan, indicating an end to an era. The era of foreign military intervention to constitute or shape countries according to a foreign design is doomed. Democratizing and state building, if not indigenous and reflects the national cultures and aspirations, are not suitable and not sustainable and remain alien to the subjected proud societies. This must be the first lesson learned from this experience in Afghanistan and the other failed experience in Iraq. However, the perceived failure or defeat of a great power, the United States and the greatest military alliance, NATO, will have its long lasting impact on the strategic configuration in the regions close to Afghanistan and maybe on the overall regional and international power politics. Afghanistan must not be abandoned and pushed to be isolated, but it is to be engaged to avoid the danger of being played out by neighboring countries in their search for building power blocks. Pakistan, Iran, China, and Russia come to mind in this respect. Undoubtedly, such development with uncertainty regarding American presence and role in the region will impact the overall balance of power in the Middle East. Allies and friends of the U.S. and the West in general will be rethinking and reconsidering their future away from the Western dominant paradigm that dominated the geopolitics of the region during the last few decades. The impact of the defeat and withdrawal of the Soviet Union from Afghanistan in 1989 changed the world then. Questions about the impact of this development on the United States, the Western countries and the world at large remain to be seen. This experience in Afghanistan reflects the strategic confusion facing the world. The world and its regions are facing immense challenges which, if not met responsibly by the community of states, particularly by great powers, the world will continue living in a state of uncertainty that threatens its future and the human progress that was achieved during the last few decades in all fields. The most dangerous threats nowadays are the state of polarization in world politics, and the vacuum in the international leadership. Let us hope that what has happened in Afghanistan will not widen this state of polarization and vacuum, that dominant power for the last seven, uh, seven decades. Therefore, doubts about the, its role and commitments to preserve regional security are accumulating and resulting in a combined strategic regional confusion and more conflicts and crises. 
victimizing, victimizing the region again in a new Cold War based on the principles of power politics is not an answer to the region's conflicts and crises. The United States and China are keen, according to their official statements, to avoid such a Cold War. But policies indicate the opposite direction. However, regional states in the Middle East must find their own approach to reconstruct a regional order that serves their national interests and preserves reg regional peace and security. This is a complicated issue, considering ongoing crises and conflicts, but there is no alternative to avoid any ramification of continued polarization and uncertainty of international politics and any future power politics between great powers. The strategic importance of the Middle East is still holding and its countries need to be put in a situation and uh, need not to be put in a situation to choose between great powers involved in a strategic contest. While it is hard to envision the future of geopolitics in the region at this turn of time, a new world order is needed to be envisioned. Such uh, this polarization, ladies and gentlemen, and uncertainty and welcome in, in, in global leadership are symptoms of a deep structural problem in the existing order caused by the failure of our world community to live to the principles of world good governance as set in the Charter of the United Nations 75 years ago. International order envisaged by the victors of the Second World War to preserve peace and security of the world is now in crisis and failing to respond to the crisis and risks facing humanity. Our interdependent and globalized world is not the world of 1945, but it is still managed by the mentality of 1945 and the mentality of the Cold War. International order needs restructuring to be fair, inclusive, and reflective of international reality where power in all its aspects is shared by many power centers. The world is so conscious of unfairness and the present order and sees it as an outdated structure and not being able to tackle the issues of the day. Without such restructuring, geopolitical risks will continue to rise and threaten world peace and security. As we have seen in many crises, the failure of the international community and especially the failure of great powers in reaching consensus in addressing, addressing crises facing our world is the constant rather than the exception. The world order does not need a new world war to have a new world order to prove that world orders in history are byproducts of major wars. Therefore, reforming the present order requires new thinking by all UN member states including the five permanent V2 members. The sustainable international order that can preserve peace and security in the world and that can meet the pressing challenges and threats facing humanity must be an equitable and representative one. The world order not, does not need to be divided again under the banners of democracy or autocracy or any other mantras and therefore dividing regions and countries accordingly. World leaders need to come to their senses. Europe can play a major role in convincing great powers to play their politics within a reformed world order that serves the interests of all and preserves peace and security for all. There must be no going back to the play of power politics and selfish ag aggrandizement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Your uh, Royal Highness, uh, for uh, uh, such a vision and such uh, developments. Uh, I, do, I do remember uh, how uh, a few years ago already, together with the King Faisal Center for, uh, for Research and Studies, uh, within the frame of what was at the time the Eurogolf Initiative, we tried to, to bridge the gaps between uh, the different uh, shores of the Mediterranean and, uh, and the Gulf. And uh, this initiative, of course, is taking a new impetus today. Uh, when we had thought about uh, this panel, we were thinking ahead of the commemoration, I should not say celebration, of course, of 9-11. Uh, it would, was a sort of 20 years after event. Well, uh, this commemoration is, was anticipated to some extent and uh, put back on the front burner, if I may say so, 
with the recent uh, fall of Kabul to the children of the previous Taliban and uh, the retreat, if I may say so, of the United States, which is to some extent both consonant with the uh, flight of the Soviet, of the Red Army, uh, from Kabul, uh, this very same city, on the 15th of February, 1989, and also uh, brings back images from uh, the flight of the US from Saigon uh, in 1975. Now, um, what I would um, like to, to question, uh, following up with what uh, Prince uh, Turki uh, suggested, is uh, to what extent within this new world order which is taking shape, and I, I do share uh, your view your uh, Highness, about uh, the fact that to some extent uh, what happened in Kabul uh, is, is a watershed uh, event for us. I mean, it is something which, of course, impacts uh, both uh, the trust of the allies of the United States in its capacity uh, to uh, defend them, if uh, need be, and uh, as you know, this is a debate which is already raging in Europe today, with some like President uh, Macron uh, asking for more autonomy for uh, Europe in terms of foreign policy and of a defense policy. I, let me refer to his famous interview to The Economist that uh, characterized the NATO as brain dead. And whereas other countries in Europe are more reluctant uh, to that, and they think that there is no way outside the uh, American umbrella militarily, because uh, building a defense policy in common, be, be building a common diplomacy is costly, is complicated, and uh, this is one of the big issues. But as far as uh, Europe and the Middle East uh, and uh, North Africa are concerned, uh, what happened in Kabul reminds us that all around the Mediterranean, east, west, uh, north, and south, we share uh, a, common, a common fate. This is not just, you know, uh, using uh, hollow, uh, hollow words, uh, uh, but uh, the Mediterranean has always been, including uh, the Gulf to some extent, the Red Sea and, uh, and the Gulf, uh, has uh, always been a sort of a twofold uh, carriageway. Uh, on the one hand, it was a conduit for an exchange of uh, ideas, of goods, and many things that you know, have contributed to the progress of mankind, including what is on our table today. Uh, for, from, the break, from breakfast to dinner, uh, but it was also a, a, a major place for warfare, for immigration being uh, accepted or forced. And uh, with the, this watershed year that we're uh, watching, and uh, something that you know was already present uh, in the aftermath of the Arab Springs, uh, we definitely need to have a much more important coordination at the regional matter. And therefore, I would uh, follow up on uh, Prince Turki's uh, vision that uh, Europe, after it has united, and maybe it is one of the many reasons why it should be far more united, has to develop a special relationship, to quote unquote, with, uh, with the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, and to, to rethink it, because uh, as, we, as, we, as we saw, uh, the capacity of world powers to guarantee peace and uh, to uh, help us uh, overcome our uh, difficulties uh, is now uh, taken to, uh, to, to question. Now, I would like to, uh, to end up here and uh, to leave uh, more, more time for uh, our uh, conversation, including with, uh, with the young uh, change makers, the very bright young change makers who gathered uh, this year in, uh, in Lugano, um, in uh, sort of um, asking uh, 
maybe directly to, to Prince Turki and uh, then uh, my colleague uh, Matteo Legrenzi from uh, Ca' Foscari University in Venice. Venice being a symbol uh, of what I'm uh, advocating. I mean, this Venice was the, the door to the Orient and also the recipient of the Orient, the, tr the introducer of, of much that came from the Orient into, into European culture and civilizations. Um, to what extent uh, do you think that it would be realistic to build uh, an alliance, uh, even a military alliance, a defense alliance, between GCC country and, and, and Europe? Uh, our colleague, Rory Stewart, who was a former uh, minister uh, in uh, Mrs. May's cabinet and uh, uh, also an Orientalist, uh, whom you know well, uh, recently published a column uh, in one of the British newspapers saying that uh, he was in, in doubt whether Europe was in the capacity to, to, to build a, a cohesive defense uh, without American help. Do you think this would be feasible, uh, Your Highness? Uh, would you, do you think that the, the Kingdom and uh, other GCC countries would be interested in developing a closer uh, defense and uh, more coordinated uh, diplomacy between, uh, between the GCC and the, and the EU? Uh, this may be one of the many questions that we could tackle during this conversation. Yeah, thank you, Professor Kepel. Um, the GCC has its own problems vis-a-vis -vis, uh, defense arrangements. Uh, this has been going on for some time. And uh, before resolving those issues, it will be difficult, if not impossible, to engage with others, uh, whether in Europe or as a NATO or, or other uh, form of alliance or any other uh, regional or international organization. Um, the GCC must put its house in order first. And uh, the, unfortunately, the, the influences around the GCC are such that uh, they have, uh, I would not say perhaps intentionally, but definitely events did not help in, in bringing the GCC together uh, for, for some time. Uh, since the Al Ula uh, summit, uh, which was held in Saudi Arabia last winter, uh, that brought together the GCC again and um, re uh, en encompassed uh, Qatar, uh, which had been boycotted uh, for a few years before that, uh, I think the first step has been taken. To, to get the GCC to put its house in order. But the GCC has many challenges around it, uh, not just uh, uh, from, from within the GCC, but from around it. If you look at the, the ambitions of countries like Iran and Turkey, for example, that have uh, expanded their interference in Arab affairs over the last decade, if not longer, uh, that is a challenge that has to be resolved uh, before there can be uh, a regional setup that can then go on to cooperate with other uh, regional setups, whether in Europe or, or elsewhere. So it's a tall order that is required from us in the GCC. Of course, I cannot speak for Europe. Uh, I see Europe has its own issues, but uh, I, this is my personal view. And I think uh, our leaders are aware of the of the of the dangers uh, around us, and therefore uh, the the Al Ula summit, as I mentioned, is is really the first step in in, in going forward uh, on an, on a on a policy and and uh, a program of uh, strengthening the ties that bind uh, the countries of the GCC. Thank you, Your uh, Royal Highness, uh, uh, for the candor and the sharpness of your remarks. I mean, uh, you certainly do not um, remember this, but I actually interviewed you for my DFIL, which was a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away on the GCC. And uh, you were then, as you are now, one of the decision makers who can speak his mind and sort of like give us a valuable food for thought. So in line I am not with... I Your Excellency, if you may, <laughs> if I may. <laughs> 
<laughs> so that's, that's very satisfying and it's, it's really excellent uh, for our own purposes today. So in line with what you just said, I mean, and, you know, bringing the, fo uh, the focus onto the Gulf, do you think that in this new post uh, sort of like um, Kabul era, do you see the possibility of uh, indeed GCC states and other Arab states embarking into a dialogue, an autonomous dialogue with Iran? How do you see the situation there? Because if you're trying to sort of get away or get a little bit less dependent, both in Europe and in the Middle East on the American hegemony, one could see this as uh, something uh, desirable and indeed necessary. So how do you see the prospect of like an autonomous GCC and Arab dialogue with Iran? Uh, well, I can, I can speak about what Saudi Arabia has been doing better than I can for the other GCC because it has been published. Uh, there are contacts now between Saudi authorities and Iranian authorities that have taken place over the past few months uh, in places like uh, Iraq and, and, uh, and Oman. Uh, nothing has come out of those uh, talks yet. Uh, what I heard from uh, publicly from from uh, Saudi foreign minister, for example, is that uh, uh, there are uh, certain issues that in Iran's conduct in the area uh, that need to be resolved be before there can be progress. I heard from the Iranian side, uh, uh, the Raisi, for example, and his, his designated foreign minister now uh, uh, say that uh, there are no issues that should impede a good relations between uh, particularly Saudi Arabia and, and Iran. So if, if both these, these statements can be uh, um, dissected and, and, uh, and uh, analyzed, I think they show that there is goodwill in order to achieve some kind of, of understanding with Iran, but that for that to take place, uh, much, much has to be done. I'll just give you one example. Uh, in Yemen, for example, uh, which is right in the heart of the Arabian Peninsula, and in the past, uh, I remember I, I, I suggested um, very, very strongly that uh, Yemen should be included in the GCC. This was more than 10 years ago. Uh, I think if we had done that at that time, we would not be facing a situation in Yemen now. But there we see a civil war inside Yemen uh, where the legitimate government, which is recognized by the world and which has been supported by the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2216 and other such uh, UN uh, resolutions, um, faces a rebellion within its own borders uh, and has called for support from the world community. Uh, in return for that, uh, Saudi Arabia and other countries in the area uh, formed a coalition to help the legitimate government face this revolt, armed revolt, by uh, one of the components of Yemeni society. Unfortunately, the United Nations Security Council resolution, which called for an arms embargo on this rebellious part of, uh, of Yemeni society uh, has not been followed by Iran. Iran is still exporting weapons and support to this rebellious group, which are the Houthis. And that is just one issue that uh, is, is blocking any potential for uh, agreement between Saudi Arabia and, and Iran and other countries in the area with, with Iran. So if, if only the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2216 was implemented, then there would be a chance for, for some, some sort of progress forward. And uh, therefore, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, and as our foreign minister, as I said before, uh, has, has uh, also stated, there are still issues that uh, have to be resolved between Saudi Arabia and Iran before we can look forward to uh, a more um, uh, amenable and a more um, uh, cooperative engagement between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Thank you very much indeed. Um, now, before like giving the word to our like uh, young change makers, I would like to ask uh, both His Royal Highness and Professor Kepel, what, what 
do you think the future of NATO is, particularly in light of the fact that now President uh, Erdogan is dealing his own cards? So what is your view uh, from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia? How do you see this uh, sort of organization? Of the that's a, that's a tall question, and I think, uh, as we see from from uh, the Secretary General of NATO itself in his, in, in his recent statements, uh, he says that that NATO uh, is facing a crisis. And as Professor Keppel uh, referred to President Macron's statement about NATO, uh, that is a that is a very indicative of the fact that NATO needs to be re envisioned by its components. Uh, you're right in saying that Turkey has, has, has uh, if you like, we have a saying in Arabic uh, which says, uh, 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 a bird chirps outside its flock. And, and definitely uh, Turkey under President Erdogan has uh, uh, veered a bit outside of, of, of NATO's uh, usual or historic uh, common positions on, on, on many things. So uh, as, as, as a potential ally, if you like, or, or supporter of, of a grouping like the GCC, NATO has to put its house in order before it can be uh, engaged with uh, to a satisfactory uh, level of cooperation uh, with the GCC. Well, I, I would um, fully agree with, uh, with Prince Turkey on, on this uh, issue. And uh, from, uh, from a European perspective, um, I believe that uh, you know, what happens with Turkey is uh, sort of very significant of what is happening now uh, that sort of uh, was exemplified by the fall of Kabul, i.e. no one is afraid of America anymore. And uh, Turkey can, Mr. Erdogan's Turkey can be simultaneously a member of NATO by S-400 uh, ground-to-air missiles from, uh, from Russia, uh, and then uh, re-Islamize uh, Hagia Sophia uh, and have uh, a very uh, um, hostile uh, statements towards a number of things that, is, that are happening in, within uh, European countries. And um, so this is definitely a problem in the sort of post-World uh, War II uh, order. Uh, you mentioned, um, Your Royal Highness, that uh, we are not uh, in 1945 anymore, that we still have a 1945 mentality. Uh, our institutions are still molded by 1945. Uh, but a number of actors of, uh, have understood that they can uh, use that to their benefit and uh, play on, uh, on, different, uh, on different tables at the same time, which is, of course, a matter for, for, major, for major uncertainty. And um, uh, there again, uh, this is why I was uh, interested in sort of trying to see, maybe I should reformulate my original question that you rightly uh, said that the GCC has to place its house in order, that Europe also has to place its house in order, that NATO has to. Uh, to what extent um, it would not be interest, interesting to develop a sort of, uh, of uh, transient sort of goodwill policy uh, with regular contacts bef between countries all around the Mediterranean who share common interests. And uh, this, I, I, I wonder, could, uh, could be a rather uh, interesting way to sort of, uh, if not break the ice, at least uh, build uh, proposals uh, that to, to, what, uh, to what others uh, could be committed. What's, what would, you, what you, would be your view on that, if I may ask? Well, that, that is already happening, in my view. Uh, uh, as far as Saudi Arabia is concerned, uh, it has set up consultation agreements with various European countries, <clears throat> the United Kingdom, uh, France, uh, I think Germany also, uh, Italy, uh, and, and other countries. Uh, 
are, are consulting with Saudi Arabia on, on issues of, uh, of importance uh, to, to both Saudi Arabia and these European countries. Um, a more formalized uh, relationship, as I said, will, will require uh, a better setup within the regional frameworks, whether it is the GCC, the European Union, or NATO. But on, on an individual basis, definitely Saudi Arabia uh, has practiced rather than simply preached uh, the, the, the principle of, uh, of coordination and consultation with uh, uh, their friends in, in, in Europe and in other places. And uh, whether it is on, on, on issues like, uh, like Lebanon, like Palestine, like Iraq, like Yemen, and now, of course, uh, uh, the, the tragedy of, 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 of Afghanistan, which continues. Uh, and I, I just want to mention one thing about Afghanistan. What, what really pains me is that uh, over the last 40 years, basically, um, uh, it is the Afghan people who have paid the price of what is happening there. Uh, they're the ones who are being killed. They're the ones who are, who are driven from their homes. They're the ones who face hunger and disease and so on. And that is uh, uh, unacceptable. And, you know, it is true that, that people trying to get out of Afghanistan now find difficulty in finding uh, planes to fly away from, from Afghanistan and the problem. But once they do, those left behind will continue to suffer and, uh, and uh, pay the price of, of the power politics that have uh, degenerated into a humanitarian crisis of, of, of immense magnitude. So uh, that is something that has to be uh, looked at more, more, more closely and, and something done about it. Thank you so much. And now for our change makers, um, Reem, please, I'm sure you have a question and uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, Assalamu uh, Alaikum, Your Royal Highness uh, Turkey Al Faisal. Let me start by saying that to you, as a person with massive experience, uh, that uh, across many, many decades is a role model, not only to a person coming from the United Arab Emirates, but for every youth across the Gulf Cooperation Council. Uh, I would like to ask you if you can kindly give us a piece of advice for the youth uh, in the Gulf Cooperation Council and in the MEM region as a whole. Thank you. Um. Shukran Jazeelan, first of all, for, for your kind words about me. Um, I, I dare not give advice when I certainly feel that I need a lot of advice myself. Uh, but what I can observe uh, is that um, consistency and, uh, and uh, dedication are, in my view, the key word to uh, progress and development. And definitely the youth today have all the available means in their hands. Um, this is what you have that my generation did not have growing up. Uh, it has all the knowledge of the world in your hands. And it, it's there for the taking. And please take it. Don't hesitate. And uh, that is something I think I see fabulous examples of that in the Emirates and other places in the area, in Saudi Arabia and the other GCC countries of young people going forward and developing their own uh, identity and their own contribution to society. Just look at the, 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 the tremendous amount that is done by volunteers uh, on issues, whether it is health, uh, hunger, uh, housing, uh, services to 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 the uh, to the communities. These are hallmarks of what the youth today in our part of the world uh, has taken advantage of this tool that I just showed you uh, in order to serve others. And you, as a representative of that generation, definitely, I'm sure, is 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 better equipped and better uh, able to contribute to humanity 
then uh, then uh, you may think you have the right to or the ability to do that. So please, Yani, knock on all doors. Don't leave a window you ha- you, that is uh, closed. Uh, open all windows to, to, to the rest of the world and make something of yourselves that uh, will help uh, us uh, as senior citizens, if I may, uh, rest assured that the future is in good hands. Thank you so much for this note of hope. Hala. <laughs> Assalamu <laughs> uh, alaikum. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Prince uh, King uh, Turkil Faisal, for giving me this opportunity to ask you the questions. Um, through your experience and understanding the, the current uh, challenges and that exist in the Middle East, uh, do you think the rising of uh, Taliban and uh, took over the authority and the power in Afghanistan that will be Uh, shape a threat on the peace and security and stability of the Middle East. And as a youth, uh, how we can deal with all these the current uh, challenges and uh, the issues that exist in our region? Thank you. Well, the, the Taliban has been around for some time. And uh, as far as, as, as they have proclaimed since taking over in Kabul now, Uh, that uh, they are not the Taliban that were in power in the 1990s, that they have changed their, 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 their idea of how to deal with issues, not just in, 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 in Afghanistan, but even outside Afghanistan. We still have to wait and see how they act on that statement. Uh, it is still too early to, to judge whether they are sincere or is it simply sweet words that they are Uh, producing in order to gain acceptance and legitimacy from the world community. But they have a responsibility to their own people. Uh, you know, the, the, the Taliban, when, when, when they, uh, they allied themselves with someone like Osama bin Laden, and uh, especially after what he did, uh, you know, from, from under Taliban protection, in in the 1990s, and they still hold that alliance with Al-Qaeda, I am a bit wary about where they may head in the next uh, time, in the next future. Um, This is something that we'll have to wait and see. You know, during the the, the negotiations between the Taliban and uh, President Karzai and then President Ghani in Afghanistan, Um, the kingdom received delegations from the Taliban who, and from the governments uh, then existing in Afghanistan for, uh, um, uh, to play a role of mediation between them. But uh, the kingdom always insisted upon the Taliban that they must break with the connection to the terrorist activities and organization called Al-Qaeda. Unfortunately, Uh, the Taliban did not accept that, uh, that uh, condition by, by Saudi Arabia. So the kingdom did not play a role in, 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 the, in the negotiations. But uh, definitely the, the, the countries that I mentioned in my presentation, Pakistan, Iran, Russia, and China, have an, uh, an obligation to the rest of the world to make sure that the Taliban stick to their statements about their changed attitude towards issues in Afghanistan. And um, it it is these countries that have the major influence now inside Afghanistan, uh, with the departure of the United States and the the NATO uh, alliance from from Afghanistan. And we'll have to wait and see how they deal uh, with with the Taliban. Thank you very much indeed. This was, I think, an enlightening session. I'm very glad to see that uh, Prince Tulski's remarks uh, maintain their sharpness and their candor, their directness. So thank you. This was extremely informative. So um, it is a real honor for me to have chaired this first session of a Mediterranean meeting this year. And I thank you, Professor Keppel, Prince Turki, and our So change makers for having participated. Thank you very much indeed.
If I may, just one last word, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, Absolutely. Please excuse, please excuse my, my attire. It is uh, based on the fact that I am uh, not only retired from, from, from government work, but also I'm enjoying a bit of holiday after the two years of incarceration as a result of COVID-19. So uh, I hope you, you didn't think of me as, as being either, uh, you know, uh, offensive or any other uh, um, designation that you may uh, attribute to, to my very uh, easygoing uh, attire that I'm presenting myself with in front of such a distinguished audience. As long as you're not an inmate in Guantanamo, we, we're, we're relieved. <laughs> so. Absolutely. A feature of uh, activism and youth and energy. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank Thanks you. a lot. Have a good day. Shukran, shukran jazilan, uh, Your Royal Highness. We're very honored and pleased to have had your wise and refreshing inputs uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia as well, not only to the youth, but share, also to the professors. We share a similar taste we in colors. Afwan? We share a similar taste in colors. Exactly, <laughs> very matching. <laughs> <laughs> so, inshallah, we'll try that out in, in Riyadh one inshallah. day. So, uh, the panel was very, very inspiring. I think, you know, with uh, Your Royal Highness um, giving the ideas of really needing uh, a reform of the world order in order to address present issues, as we uh, have heard, uh, Afghanistan, uh, all the first uh, steps uh, that are uh, happening also within the GCC are very, very important. So also the first steps of having, uh, you know, uh, after the Alula uh, summit, um, that Qatar, uh, the, the boycott has been lifted, and also the first steps of Saudi Arabia having, um, you know, uh, first talks with Iran are signs that things are happening, still maybe behind the scenes, but uh, there is a will to go towards a better future. And I think with all the nations uh, doing their um, responsibility in that, um, in that sense, in order to have peace and security for all, and especially for the next generation. I think this is um, not only uh, the case in the MENA region, but all over the world. So